you. Um, thank you, everyone, for sort of coming today. And uh, I'm super excited to basically talk about a few a areas. And what I want to talk about today is sort of the dawn of um, machine learning and applications to real-time communication, right? And I think we are at a really interesting cusp in terms of what is going on with the commoditization of machine learning. Uh, we were actually in China a couple of weeks ago uh, seeing the state of the art in terms of machine learning. And in China, believe it or not, you could actually go to KFC, order food, smile at the camera and pay for it, right? You don't have to do anything else. And so I think we are at a very interesting sort of uh, fertile ground where a, a whole bunch of very interesting techniques are getting commoditized, and you want to be able to apply that to further the state of the art in sort of real-time communications. And hopefully what I want to do today is sort of give you guys a flavor of some of those problems and sort of uh, how you can arrive at very interesting sort of optimizations by marrying both of those two techniques together. This is Chris Cranky being not helpful as usual riding a bicycle, but it is what it is. Um, so uh, one of the things we were talking about to say, how can we marry these two fields in a way which makes sort of sense and sort of uh, increases the state of the art in real-time communication? And we came up with this very simple concept called content-aware adaptation and sort of real-time communication, right? And so this was the brainchild of Cesar, who's in the audience, who's our mobile architect, and he's right here. Um, but I think it's, it's sort of an illustrative example of a very simple idea which can be extremely powerful if, if applied uh, the right way. See, so the, the, the thing we were trying to solve as an example is a very simple problem. How do you optimize the quality of experience of face-to-face -face video? Uh, believe it or not, this is an actual sort of conference room from which I, uh, I have a lot of my calls. Obviously not great. The background's cluttered with all kinds of junk. And if you actually think about an experience like this, what really matters in terms of an object of interest is my face, right? So I'm, I'm having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody else. The fact that you can read that it says Cat5 cables on the background is sort of immaterial, right, if you think about it. And so one of the things we wanted to do is to say, hey, a lot of interesting ideas have gotten commoditized in AI and face detection being one of it. Can we marry that somehow and sort of increase the quality in real-time communication? Can, how can we apply these techniques to real-time communication? And the simple observation is, uh, it's fairly straightforward. You detect the face, and some, somehow you want to be able to use more data, more information to enco encode the region of the face relative to the background. So in, in a case where you want to throttle down the quality, you'd rather have like a fuzzy background but a really clear face than uniformly degrading the entire sort of experience, right? So that's the simple concept. And again, a bunch of intuitions sort of led us to this path. First intuition, in a face-to-face -face call, faces are objects of interest. There are other objects of interest. It could be a whiteboard in a classroom. There's all, all kinds of things, but think about objects of interest in sort of video. The second observation is face detection, contour matching, edge detection, all of these, these systems have become commoditized. And that's where the power of machine learning and deep learning in a way which is not previously possible has gotten commoditized, right? GPUs are getting faster. You can do faster and faster computation in, in the edges themselves in a way, again, which was not previously feasible. And I think this is important for real-time uh, communication. You could borrow very interesting ideas from other domains like static image processing that are techniques like seam carving. And I'll talk a little bit about what seam carving is, where objects of interest are given more priority relative to other objects in an image. And finally, the observation is, obviously, the, you want to use more data for objects you're interested in within a frame relative to anything else. And so just to give you an example, this is what seam carving looks like. Uh, the image on the left is the original image. So you see a ca castle and somebody walking. Uh, if I actually scale the image, if I actually scale this image, you have all these visual artifacts, right, where you have a skinny castle and a skinny person, which you may not want. And techniques like seam carving this is a seam carved image, try to maintain relative proportions of images which are objects of interest. In this case, the castle seems to look fine, the person seems to look fine, you know, other things relatively in the frame could get sort of scaled down. And we wanted to marry all of these ideas in a very interesting way and say, can we use face detection and some sort of custom shader, and for those of you who don't know, think of shader as just some sort of image transformation, to make sort of content-aware adaptation in real-time video. This is very different from the concept of content-aware encoding, which is used in sort of offline video on demand, right? And so here's a very simple example. 
So what we wanted to do was to say, okay, I'm going to take the original image which gets outputted from the camera. I am going to do some sort of fast face detection and detect if a face exists, which happens to be my object of interest. I'm going to apply a, transform a transformation on that image itself, which happens to be scaling it. And don't worry, nobody sees this. This part happens under the cover, so nobody sees sort of an enlarged view of Cesar. Um, but essentially, if you think about this, it's a very simple but powerful concept in a way where if I encoded this image, I am using most of my information to encode a region of interest, which happens to be the face, which is covering the, the frame, relative to the background. And so you can almost think of this as sort of an interesting way to somehow force uh, more data to be used in regions of interest relative to other areas, right? You send that down the wire. On the other side, I get this sort of scaled image, and I can sort of re-shrink it back, sort of descale it back to the original proportions before I display it. But the artifact of doing that is I have spent more time actually encoding. There's more information to use to render this part of the, this region of the image relative to the background. So you can trade off a fuzzy background for actually sharper faces or sharper objects of interest, right? Uh, the implementation is very simple. You, you take the camera and you capture the image coming out of the camera and you render it. So the local view is always something which looks normal, not like cartoonish. But what you do is then you take that image, run so, sort of a fast face detection algorithm, and then you sort of scale up or you, you sort of magnify the image and send that to the encoder. And this is what happens in the publisher and gets sent through the wire. And on the decode side of it, the decode basically receives sort of the magnified or sort of scaled up image. It also has the face position. It sort of applies an inverse transform in this case is to okay, get it back to original proportions. It's sent to the renderer, and that's what gets viewed on the other side, right? Um, it's, it's a very powerful concept, especially useful in sort of constrained network situations. In a, in a, in a, in a scenario where I want to throttle down the quality or the, 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 the bit rate of, a, of an image, of a video, you don't want to treat all things equally, and you want to treat different regions of the image uh, sort of uh, in, a, in, a, in a higher uh, priority way. So our design goals were very simple. We wanted something dead fast. We wanted it to be fast. After all, we're all in the business of real-time communication, so latency and speed and being generally fast is important. We wanted something dead simple. This is sort of a new mantra of mine, and I'm sure all the engineers at TalkBox are sort of tired of yeah, hearing me say it, which is we want very, very sort of simple concepts which turn out to be quite powerful. Uh, we want to be able to use commodity stuff, right? I don't want to go and touch the encoder or decoder or do some fancy mumbo jumbo, right? We need to be able to sort of make this agnostic to other parts of the, the pipeline itself. So we the implementation is fairly straightforward. We've built a simple sample code based on top of the OpenTalk platform. And I'm sure you could do this on native WebRTC. Um, it's completely doable. Uh, we have a native application, which is an Android sample app, which serves as a publisher, and a Mac OS application, which serves as a subscriber. We use a standard Android camera and face detection API. In fact, I think the API we use might even be deprecated, but it is, for the purposes of the argument, it works fine. It's fast. Um, we use a custom capturer and renderer, which gives us the ability to sort of intercept data coming from the camera, do some sort of transformation, and then pass it down to the encoder, right? And do the, the converse on the other side. We detect the face. We have some loose region of interest, which is some sort of a bounding box. We are able to scale that out. And I think this is sort of a very important thing, is we need to be able to send that face position over to the other side so that the inverse transform actually uses an accurate face position. Now, if that were out of sync with the frame itself, you could have weird artifacts, right? And so we wanted a mechanism where we can quickly synchronize metadata at a frame level. And this is not just useful for implementations such as this. You could easily see uh, AR-type use cases or other sort of, uh, sort of uh, scenarios where you want to be able to have metadata synchronized at the frame level sent over to the other side, right? And the limitations are obviously, at least we don't know of any good way to do this on the web as yet, because you need a custom media processing pipeline. And more importantly, you need a mechanism where you could synchronize metadata at the frame level, which at least as far as I know is not possible on the web. right? But nonetheless, 
you could sort of leverage WebRTC, you could leverage commoditized machine learning, and optimize the native experience or mobile experience uh, fairly effectively. Um, here's another example. We were always worried that this might not show up well on the projector, but that's Cesar, which is on a regular video call, and the Cesar on a content of our adapted call. The, and the interesting thing note, and I don't know if you can see that very well, is the background is clearer and sharper on the left than on the right. And as we were talking about this, we said, OK, we need a more powerful way to show uh, this difference. And Cesar is very proud of his mustache, and decided we will zoom into Cesar's mustache and show you the details. So you can see the regular uh, experience on the left and sort of the content of our adapted experience on the right. And we have this edge detected as well. So if you can see, uh, there's a lot more details which are preserved. Uh, when you have content of our adaptation uh, relative to something else. And I think you know, uh, this can have very interesting sort of quality optimization effects. Um, but you could even have certain regions which are at HD, whereas the background could be at a VGA uh, type resolution. Right? So I think it's, 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 it's a simple concept which basically marries advances in machine learning with existing sort of functionality in real-time communication, say, the most interesting problems, at least I firmly believe, in the future of real-time communication are going to be at the cusp of what you can do with ML and sort of RTC itself. So I have a video, and see, let's see if we can get this to play. And this is a series of uh, video shots where I, we turn on and off the content of our adaptation. And when you see the green lines close by, it basically says we have optimized the face region relative to anything else in the background. right? And when it zooms out, it basically says everything is treated equally. And you can immediately see Cesar's face details are sort of lower. And the clarity of the background gets better. And ideally, what you want to do is this, is you want to treat the face region sort of in higher quality than anything else. Now, obviously, this could be a classroom, and you want the whiteboard to have more uh, resolution. You could apply this concept to sort of any arbitrary sort of region of interest. And so. I've sort of come to the end of my talk, and I want to say four things have broadly enabled this. If you truly think about this, why was this not possible four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, is face detection and all these ML algorithms are fast, and they've become commoditized, and they're available at the edge. They've become fast GPUs, but the edge itself have become computationally more efficient, but you can do this in real time. Uh, custom pipelines have become possible where you can apply some sort of transformation. And we, we now have mechanisms to sort of sync metadata at a frame level. And I think this is sort of an illustrative example, but we're only scratching the surface of what is possible. I think there's going to be huge advances in terms of improving real-time communication through sort of the advent of ML. And I'm super excited to sort of hear and see what you guys sort of build using these techniques. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much.